This is Kidney Cancer News. I'm Terry Kanoski, and welcome to this month's edition of Kidney Cancer News. Kidney cancer patients fare better with tumor removal only. According to an article appearing in Health Day and Yahoo News, kidney cancer patients who have only the tumor removed, not the entire kidney, have higher survival rates, according to a new study. That research involves more than 7,000 Medicare patients with early-stage kidney cancer who underwent surgery to remove either the entire organ or only the tumor and a small margin of healthy tissue around it. Early-stage kidney cancers are becoming more common and are often discovered by chance when patients receive an X-ray or CT scan for an unrelated condition. According to Dr. David Miller, assistant professor of urology at University of Michigan Medical School, this study does not suggest that every patient with early-stage kidney cancer should get a partial nephrectomy. The American Cancer Society estimates that nearly 65,000 people in the U.S. will be diagnosed with kidney cancer this year. Nearly 14,000 will die from the disease. I'd like to uh, thank the Kidney Cancer Association, the organizers, and the participants in the meeting for the opportunity to talk today about outcomes for patients with locally advanced disease. So patients with locally advanced disease are patients who are high, at high risk of developing metastatic disease after nephrectomy. We'll talk about lymph node invasion, uh, tumors that extend into the venous system, uh, tumors that uh, extend beyond the capsule uh, into the perinephric fat, uh, tumors that extend into adjacent organs, and also the role of uh, adjuvant systemic therapy. So we'll begin with uh, invasion of lymph nodes. Historically, we saw this much more often, uh, but nowadays with the advent of uh, cross-sectional imaging, CT scanners in most ERs, we're finding patients a lot earlier with smaller lesions. Uh, so this is a pretty rare event, maybe 3 to 5 percent. We also know the incidence is based on uh, how well you look. If you do a limited lymph node dissection, you find less than if you do a more extensive lymph node dissection. And uh, most patients with nodal disease will also have distant metastatic disease. So we know that it's more common in patients with higher stage disease. This study at UCLA uh, looked at 661 patients and patients who had T3 or T4 disease, so uh, tumors that weren't confined to the kidney, there's a 20% rate of uh, tumor in the lymph nodes. We also know <clears throat> this is more common with higher Furman grade. Uh, in uh, patients, uh, this is another study at UCLA, two-thirds of patients who had uh, lymph node negative disease had low grade disease whereas uh, two-thirds of patients with no positive disease had high-grade disease. And this was also confirmed in other studies. So the, uh, the important thing to realize is that patients with uh, kidney cancer into their lymph nodes are more likely to die from cancer. This is a study out of the Mayo Clinic, a large study. And if you notice that the uh, survival for patients uh, who do not have lymph node invasion is uh, significantly better than for patients who do have lymph node invasion. So we know that when we see this at the time of surgery, it's a bad thing. So within, within uh, patients who have uh, lymph node uh, metastasis, we know that uh, the histological subtype matters, the number of lymph nodes probably matters, as well as the lymph node density and extranodal extension. So this is a study out of MD Anderson looking at patients who have papillary renal cell, uh, papillary subtype, uh, has actually a better prognosis if you have uh, disease within your lymph nodes. You can see here the patients who had papillary disease had a 65% uh, survival at five years compared to the patients who had a clear cell who did not do very well. This is another study at MD Anderson looking at uh, the survival was dependent on the number of positive lymph nodes. Um, they had 40 patients and uh, looked at uh, the survival and uh, it was much better if you only had one lymph node positive where if you had uh, more than one lymph node positive, you did worse. The concept of uh, lymph node density has also been uh, shown to be predictive of how well a patient does after surgery. Uh, this is a study out of Italy looking at uh, lymph node density. Uh, what the definition is, is it's the ratio of the uh, number of nodes to the total of nodes involved. Um, and this may be ac actually a, a better indicator of the quality of surgery because in, more, quali in uh, more extensive dissections, you're going to get more lymph nodes and uh, have a larger denominator. Extranodal extension is also something people think is uh, uh, important. This is when the uh, tumor extends beyond the lymph node, outside of the lymph node. 
Um, and this uh, study found that this was also an important variable. So the benefits of uh, lymph node dissection, we think, are twofold. Uh, number one, it provides more accurate staging, so we can identify patients who are at risk of disease. And it also may provide a therapeutic benefit in patients who do not have distant metastasis and only have metastasis in their lymph node, and we may be able to cure these patients with surgery alone. However, with any surgical procedure, there's always potential complications. Uh, we found in a couple large studies that the complications were generally not increased in patients with uh, lymph node dissection at the time of nephrectomy compared to nephrectomy alone. Uh, nonetheless, we worry about things like bleeding, uh, bowel injury, uh, chylocystitis, which is a, a large lymph leak after surgery, uh, and ultimately death. Unfortunately, the available studies of uh, patients with kidney cancer and lymph node dissection all have major limitations. All these studies are retrospective, so we're looking backwards uh, with one notable exception. Um, they're mostly with small numbers of patients. There's a selection bias. Uh, anytime uh, these patients underwent lymph node dissection, these are probably more healthy patients because we're doing a more extensive surgery. Uh, there's a lack of standardized template, uh, so people don't agree on what, what type of surgery we should be doing. There's a lack of uh, standardized uh, pathologic examination, uh, and that can really skew the results. And there's also a lack of defined uh, post-surgical treatments. So which lymph nodes need to be removed for kidney cancer? Uh, this is a, a key question. The initial studies were done in the 1930s, and they were done on normal kidneys. Uh, in normal kidneys, the lymphatics follow the arteries back into the renal sinus and drain into the regional lymph nodes. However, kidney cancer is an abnormal situation. Uh, we know that kidney cancers uh, make uh, a lot of blood vessels, um, and that can alter the drainage patterns. We also know that the lymphatic drainage in the perinephric fat is not the same as uh, in, in the kidney itself. So as the uh, tumor spreads, this may actually alter the drainage pattern. So there's many different possibilities for what we uh, will remove at the time of surgery. This shows the uh, hyalur dissection, and this, this, just, uh, this is kind of the most limited lymph node dissection we perform, where we just take the lymph nodes that are right along the renal vessels. This is a little bit more extensive, where we uh, take some of the lymph nodes along the aorta or the inferior vena cava. And then the extended lymph node dissection. This shows the left side of dissection where we take the, uh, all the lymph nodes along the aorta uh, from the diaphragm down to the, the bifurcation. And on the right side, we take all the lymph nodes that are next to the uh, vena cava and also between the aorta and the vena cava. This is a little bit uh, easier way to uh, look at it. Let's see if my mouse works here. So uh, this is the before and after picture of lymph node dissection. The uh, large artery in the middle, the uh, white structure, is the aorta. It carries all the blood from your heart down to your lower extremities. And the vena cava is the uh, blue structure where the uh, white towel is, which carries all the blood back from your lower extremities to your heart. And this is an extended lymph node dissection. You can see all the lymph nodes have been removed from this patient. I'm sorry? Uh, they're on this side. You can see that, light, that white structure in the middle. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. It's hard to distinguish them from the fat in there as well. So. Mm -hmm. oh. I see. So here you can see the lymph nodes right here and kind of up. And this is the aorta here, and here's the inferior vena cava going back. So we take all the tissue that's in the middle on these sides. So there's st uh, several studies which support performing lymph node dissection. Uh, this is a study at UCLA uh, which uh, looked at 900 patients who underwent lymph node dissection, and they saw there was a five-month increase in median survival uh, if patients had any type of lymph node dissection. There was no benefit for patients who didn't have uh, clinically neg who had clinically neg negative nodes, meaning if we couldn't see them on the CT scan beforehand, there was no uh, benefit to doing it. Most patients with positive lymph nodes were identified preoperatively, about 90 percent. This is a study out of uh, MD Anderson, uh, which is uh, just in press, uh, looking at patients who had uh, tumor in their lymph nodes but did not have any evidence of distant metastasis. And this, this study showed, importantly, that some patients had a durable cure with surgery alone. So 22 percent of the patients, one out of every five patients who had a lymph node dissection alone, uh, were cured. 
with a 44-month follow-up. And again, most of these patients were identified preoperatively. So there are some studies that also question the benefit of lymph node dissection. Uh, this is a study out of Italy <coughs> looking at uh, patients who underwent lymph node dissection and comparing them to patients who underwent a nephrectomy alone. Um, interestingly, the, uh, the numbers are pretty small here, and most of the pa only they only had one patient who had a positive note on pathology. So these are probably not the patients who we think would benefit to begin with, but they, they found no uh, survival difference. This is the only randomized trial. Um, this is a trial out of Europe where they, they uh, randomized patients to nephrectomy or nephrectomy plus lymph node dissection, and they found no difference in cancer-specific survival. Again, they were looking at patients who we probably wouldn't think uh, would benefit from lymph node dissection to begin with, patient with small uh, localized tumors. So in summary, do patients benefit from lymph node dissection? We think yes in, if you have enlarged lymph nodes on your preoperative imaging or if you have inter intraoperative evidence of lymph node disease. We do not think there's a benefit if there's uh, organ-confined tumors or uh, no clinical evidence of lymph node involvement on your preoperative and intraoperative assessment. And it's a possibility in patients who have advanced tumors and no evidence of lymph node involvement that these patients may uh, get some benefit. Moving on to uh, tumor thrombus, tumors that invade the uh, venous system. This occurs about 40 to 10 percent of the time. It can occur just in the kidney or uh, move into the vena cava and all the way up into the heart. Only about 1 percent of them reach into the heart, into the right atrium. Associated symptoms uh, include lower extremity swelling, uh, right-sided varicocele, and that's a dilation of the veins around, around the man, uh, man's testis, uh, pulmonary embolus, a blood clot in the lungs, caput medusa, which is a dilation of the veins around your uh, umbilicus, your belly button, protein present in the urine. Uh, you can also get uh, advanced cardiac or lung, lung symptoms if it's a higher level, level thrombus, and uh, non-functional renal units in the end. So there's many different classifications of uh, tumor thrombus. This is from the Mayo Clinic. You can see as the uh, tumor extends out of the kidney here, it can go, it can be just in the renal vein or it can extend into the vena cava or eventually up and into the heart, causing the most severe symptoms. So for <coughs> surgery in these patients is difficult. Uh, the first resection was reported in 1919. This was once considered a death sentence. Uh, modern theories have the mortality less than 5%. Uh, it does increase if the thrombus is above the diaphragm. 40 to 70% of these patients uh, without metastatic disease can be cured uh, with surgery alone, and that's an important point. So it's important to, uh, to uh, do uh, accurate imaging for these uh, patients. Uh, we need to know the extent of the thrombus. Uh, this can be done with a uh, multi-detector CT scan or a MRI. Uh, while the patient is in surgery, we also do a transesophageal echocardiogram uh, to make sure that the uh, thrombus does not move during, some, during surgery. So what surgery uh, entails for these patients, we'll start with the lower level thrombuses. Um, we get control of the renal artery. We then ligate the uh, lumbar veins. Here you can see in the uh, first tile, this is the thrombus extending into the vena cava. We get control above and below and on the contralateral kidney. We then make an incision in the vena cava and remove the entire thrombus as well as the kidney. And then we repair the vena cava where we took the thrombus out. And then we breathe a sigh of relief and, and go home and everyone's happy. Um, now when it gets higher, uh, it requires mobilization of the liver. Uh, which occasionally requires including the hepatic blood supply. This is why these are more dangerous surgeries. And the level four thrombus, uh, this actually may require open heart surgery, uh, requiring a sternotomy and uh, multiple surgical teams involved. It uh, places patients at an increased risk for bleeding, stroke, and heart attack. But it's important to realize that surgery can provide a durable cure in these patients without metastatic disease. So uh, even though the surgery can be very complicated and difficult, some patients will survive, greater than 50 percent of these patients will survive with just surgery alone and not have any recurrence of their disease. 
There's some controversy because some studies show that the level of the uh, thrombus is important. Uh, other studies uh, show that uh, this just may be a result of uh, low numbers uh, or the failure to uh, evaluate other predictors of bad outcomes. We know that perinephric fat invasion is a bad uh, predictor. Lymph node involvement, sarcomatoid features, which are uh, aberrant differentiation in the pathology, as well as invasion into the blood vessel wall. And so this is one study, it's a small study, which uh, showed that the thrombus level impacted survival. Um, development of metastatic disease was seen in 10 of 49 patients with a thrombus below the diaphragm and four of seven patients who had a thrombus higher. This is an, another study which did not uh, show the same thing, which showed that the level of tumor thrombus did not affect survival. Uh, this was a little bit larger study. And this is probably the largest study, almost 1,200 patients from 13 different institutions in Europe. Uh, again, they showed there was no difference ba based on the uh, level in the IVC, but there was a difference for the patients who just had a thrombus in the renal vein compared to the patients who had a thrombus higher than the renal vein. So there's other factors which may affect survival in patients with venous invasion. Uh, this is a, a study at UCLA looking at 300 patients, and they found that uh, metastatic disease, either distant or in the lymph nodes, was the strongest predictor of survival, uh, as well as the patient's performance status, how well they were able to do their uh, normal uh, activities, uh, invasion into the lymph nodes, sarcomatoid features, and perinephric fat invasion. We looked at our own experience at uh, MD Anderson, uh, and found that uh, six, uh, in 605 patients over the last 15 years, similar, similar things were uh, predictive. Uh, so if you had a clear cell subtype that was actually better than if you had uns uh, different uh, subtypes, uh, higher grade tumors did worse, perinephric fat invasion was important, sarcomatoid dedifferentiation, uh, lymph node metastasis and distant metastasis were all predictive. One other interesting thing we found was that uh, microscopic tumor which was present at the uh, margin of resection in the vein, um, was also predictive of increased local recurrence and metastatic progression. So we think that it's important to uh, resect the veins widely when at all possible. And this shows the, uh, the top line here is patients who had uh, negative, negative margins on their vein. And this is uh, freedom from uh, these are patients who don't look, uh, recur locally. And it's higher in patients who do have a uh, positive vein margin. And the same thing was true when we look at uh, patients who progress to metastatic disease. If you have a, a negative vein margin, uh, you do better than if you have a positive vein margin. So in summary, patients who have uh, venous involvement are at a high risk to develop metastatic disease. Significant portion, uh, proportion of patients with metas uh, without metastatic disease when they first present can be cured by surgery alone, which is encouraging. Uh, surgery requires careful planning and should involve experienced surgeons. And in general, the prognosis is not changed by the level of the thrombus, uh, except for in, in patients who have a renal vein thrombus only. So when the uh, tumor starts to extend outside of the kidney into the perinephric fat, it also uh, indicates a bad prog prognosis for the patient. This is a study looking at patients who had uh, tumor thrombus, and uh, half, about half the patients had thrombus alone, and about the other half had uh, thrombus in association with fat invasion. After surgery, the patients who only had a thrombus with no fat invasion had a significantly uh, improved survival, 70 months, compared to patients who had uh, thrombus and fat invasion who only survived about 25 months. So what that tells us is that fat invasion is, is a very bad prognostic factor. Again, this is a, 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 a European study looking at almost 2,000 patients. Uh, they know that it's difficult to identify uh, preoperatively. CT scans and MRIs don't pick this up. This is something that we pick up only pathologically. Um, it's an important risk factor across all stages of disease, uh, and, the, uh, and it affects survival in patients. It's something we uh, have to consider after nephrectomy. So in summary, patients with fat invasion are at a higher risk to have uh, disease recurrence, and radiographic staging is inadequate to distinguish between patients with, uh, with or without perinephric fat invasion. So <laughs> when the, uh, the tumors get out of the kidney and invade adjacent organs, you might also uh, uh, suspect this is a, a bad prognostic sign. This is a patient who has a, a kidney tumor, uh, which is invading into the liver here. 
This is also something that's relatively rare, these uh, T4 tumors, are, uh, because kidney tumors are more likely to compress the other organs rather than invade into it. And these patients have a very poor prognosis with five-year survivals between 5 and, and 20 percent. Complete surgical excision is very important in these patients, uh, including the involved organs, uh, if you're going to you have any chance of cure. So the organs and the structures at, at risk, the adrenal gland, which sits on top of the kidney, is uh, one organ which is frequently involved, the posterior abdominal wall, the paraspinous muscles, which go along your vertebral column, the diaphragm, the uh, spleen, the duodenum, the pancreas, and the colon, including the uh, blood supply, which goes through the mesentery. This study uh, looked at uh, 38 patients with advanced disease. They found that uh, the liver was the most common uh, location for uh, 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 invasion, and they, their median survival was less than a year after resection. The only significant uh, factor uh, in these patients uh, which uh, predicted death was uh, a positive surgical margin. So this, uh, this tells us that it's very important to take out the entire uh, tumor as well as any adjacent organs in these patients. So can we predict this invasion preoperatively? This is a study out of MD Anderson, Dr. Margulis, uh, and Dr. Wood looking at uh, 30 patients with uh, clinical T4 disease, they found that uh, they were wrong more than they were right as far as 60 percent of the time it was downstaged on final pathology. And their conclusion was that you cannot adequately predict a T4 tumor by preoperative and intraoperative imaging. So when we compare adrenal invasion, which is a common uh, area that, uh, a common gland that, that uh, it invades to compared to the perinephric uh, invasion, this is a retrospective study of 1,000 patients. Uh, almost 200 had perinephric fat invasion, and about 2.5% had uh, direct adrenal invasion. We found that the survival was much worse with adrenal invasion compared to perinephric fat invasion. So perinephric fat invasion is bad, and adrenal invasion is worse. So a summary on the adjacent organ invasion. Uh, kidney cancer compresses much more often than it invades. So many times we think something in, in, uh, while we're in clinic is invasive and we're wrong. There's a poor prognosis with invasion of adjacent organs. The majority of patients with T4 disease also have metastatic disease. Surgical resection, complete surgical resection, is the only chance for a cure in these patients. And there's a, a lot of studies lacking in T4 disease, mostly because this is rare, rare and it's hard to identify preoperatively. And adrenal invasion is worse than perinephric fat involvement. So the, uh, the next portion of this talk is on adjuvant therapy, uh, systemic therapy now or later. Um, with the recent success of targeted agents and the uh, dramatic uh, uh, responses and increases in patient survival, uh, the people are asking is there a benefit to start patients who are high risk uh, on these therapies right after nephrectomy. The uh, definition of adjuvant therapy to be distinguished from neoadjuvant therapy, which Dr. Wood will be talking about later, um, is taking some form of therapy after complete surgical resection to decrease the risk of recurrence. And again, we think this is most indicated in high-risk patients. Uh, we've seen earlier that high-risk patients are, are these patients, patients with uh, venous invasion, lymph node involvement, uh, large tumors, uh, invasion into the adjacent organs, or perinephric fat involvement. So many different therapies have been tried. It's, uh, recently, uh, local therapy, hormonal therapy, uh, immunotherapy during the cytokine era, uh, certain tumor vaccines, and uh, thalidomide have also all, all been tried. And the, uh, the short answer is none of these have worked. Uh, so there's no survival benefit to any of these therapies that have seen, been seen. The, really, the big question is with targeted therapy, uh, is there going to be some benefit? And for the large part, the jury is still out. There have been uh, many different studies ongoing, and, and not, not, uh, not much has been reported as of yet. So this is one, <clears throat> this is one trial it's called the ERISER trial, looking at monoclonal antibody uh, G250. Uh, this, uh, we're still waiting the results of this trial. One interesting thing that did come out of this trial is a PET, <coughs> excuse me, PET scan, which is specific for kidney cancer. Uh, this is very promising. This was reported at last year's AUA. Um, You can see this uh, detects uh, kidney cancer. A lot of times when things are very small, we have a difficult time detecting them on a conventional CT scan. This is not yet FDA approved. This is another trial, the ASSURE trial, which uh, finished uh, accrual last fall. We're waiting on the results of this. This uh, randomized patients to either 
sunitinib and serafinib, uh, or a combination with a placebo. One issue that we did uh, see in these patients were that uh, a lot of patients left treatment not because they were finished treatment and not because uh, they progressed, but because they were having difficulty with toxicity. So we have uh, identified the fact that uh, patients who uh, take these targeted agents uh, and don't have any metastatic disease uh, have a significant adverse effect profile. This is another study which is uh, uh, ex expected the primary result in uh, June 2017. This is the S-TRAC trial looking at patients with uh, sunitinib or placebo. This trial is the uh, SOURCE trial. Again, uh, the, uh, the primary result is expected in 2012, uh, randomizing patients to either three years of serafinib, one year serafinib, or placebo. This is the uh, new uh, GSK trial uh, looking at uh, pazopinib in the adjuvant setting. And this is the newest trial looking at everolimus for renal cell cancer, uh, randomizing patients to either placebo or everolimus after nephrectomy. So in summary, adjuvant therapy, we're currently waiting on the results of several trials uh, which uh, uh, have been with agents which have shown promise in the metastatic setting. The uh, toxicity for treatment is a major issue with a lot of patients stopping adjuvant uh, treatment with targeted agents. Thank you. On April 16th this year, the, the um, National Cancer Institute is releasing the latest cancer statistics. Our statistics that we're currently releasing are from 1973 all the way to 2009. Um, we are just now releasing data from 2009, and this reflects the complicated process that we go through to collect, collect the data and ensure the quality of the information that we collect. So the 2009 information on overall mortality shows a continuation of the decline in mortality rates that we've seen since the late 1990s. The top four cancers that we see are um, prostate cancer, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and lung cancer. And together, these four sites make up over 50% of the cancers that we find um, in, our, in our data set. All the mortality rates for all of those cancers in men and women when, for colorectal cancer and lung cancer are all decreasing. And that's a continued decrease from what we've seen in the last few years. For incidence, um, it, for lung cancer, for both men and women, it's decreasing. Prostate cancer is decreasing. Colorectal cancer is, is decreasing. And breast cancer is relatively stable. Two cancer sites where we've seen persisting differences between um, white women and, and black women are cervical cancer and breast cancer. Cervical cancer, the rates are declining for both incidence and mortality in both groups. However, blacks remain at higher risk than whites for incidence and mortality. For breast cancer, it's a complex picture where whites have higher level of incidence, risk of developing breast cancer. but blacks have higher mortality rates. And the difference in mortality between white and black women has been increasing over time rather than decreasing. Lung cancer incidence is declining this year in both men and women, and mortality is declining in men and women as well. However, the trends are very different for men than they are for women. Men have much higher rates but had a decline that started earlier and has continued. Women have had lower rates but they've been fairly level lately and have only shown a decline in the last few years. But with the 2009 data point, we do see a statistically significant decline in incidence and mortality for women as well as men. These trends reflect patterns of smoking in the U.S. Um, where men had higher rates of smoking than women and perhaps stopped smoking earlier. It typically takes a a long time between the smoking behavior and changes in that behavior and when we see the impact on cancer incidence and mortality. The data that we base our statistics on are from the SEER uh, registry program and SEER stands for Surveillance, Epidemiology and End Results. When we started SEER back in 1975 we had nine registries, but as time has gone on, we've added more registries to get a better representation of the population um, as far as having adequate covers of different race groups, urban areas versus rural areas, and now in 2009, we have 18 registries and 28% of the population. 
SEER is also part of a larger national program of cancer registries that also includes the registries that are managed by CDC. Together, they cover the vast majority of the United States and each state in the, in the U.S. has a cancer registry. SEER registries are really a fundamental component of the data system for cancer research and uh, monitoring and surveillance. They're really widely used by researchers, public policy, and of course the public to understand their prognosis after diagnosis. It is also a basis of, of many different annual reports that come out that really describe the cancer burden in the United States. It's part of the um, annual report to the nation which describes incidence and mortality for the whole U.S. and it also plays an important role in reports such as um, the American Cancer Society's Facts and Figures where they estimate the number of cases that they expect to be diagnosed in the current year and the number of cases they expect to die in the current year um, for each for different cancer sites. Join us again next month for another edition of Kidney Cancer News. I'm Carrie Kanoski, wishing you good health. Join us again next month for another edition of Kidney Cancer News, produced by the Kidney Cancer Association. Find us on the web at kidneycancer.org. This is Dick Lashbrook speaking.